Conversations with Tyler is produced by the Mercatus Center at George Mason University, bridging the gap between academic ideas and real-world problems. Learn more at mercatus.org. And for more conversations, including videos, transcripts, and upcoming dates, visit conversationswithtyler.com. Before you begin, one thing, let me express my admiration for him. I'm a strange communist, like Marx, who said that one can learn more from a conservative like Balzac than from all progressives about economy. I think that our only true partners, the true leftists today, are modest, intelligent, honest skeptics conservatives. This morning he provided the best, I'm grateful for it, the best definition of myself. He told me that he considers me a moderate conservative communist. My gratitude to you. <laughs> you. I would like to pursue this theme. Thank you for your remarks. The assigned topic was why I am still a communist. I think, in fact, what you argued was why I am no longer a communist and you can be thought of as favoring a kind of social democracy with more effort directed at climate change. But before we get to psychoanalyzing you, <laughs> let me start with a simple factual question. So yes, you, you yes. cite China as the biggest success story of communism. But is it so successful? It has right now the per capita income pretty much exactly equal to Mexico. Not so impressive. Yes. If you look at capitalist Taiwan, it has the per capita income of France, single payer health insurance, gay marriage, it's a complete liberal democracy. Life there is very nice. Furthermore, the last 30 years, the air in Taiwan has become much cleaner, and the air in China has become much dirtier. So why isn't China the failure, Taiwan the success? And yes, it's a vote for capitalism, not communism. Oh, yeah, you're already asking me a question. Okay. Yes, it's yeah, a yeah, question. No, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> no, no. First, uh, but if you compare what, what China 50 years ago, the difference is still absolutely shocking. Look at Shanghai, Beijing today, and so on. Second point, you know, uh, forget about per capita, compare prices and so on, and you will see that today's China, that today's China, the standard of living of middle classes, at least in the developed part, you know, numbers at this level don't tell a lot, but at one point, I agree with you that uh, this in the long term, this, whatever we call it, Chinese authoritarian capitalism or whatever we call it, will not work, I think. And China has put over a million people in concentration camps. Their labor force is already shrinking. Rate of growth is falling. So you are, in fact, a moderate right pro-Taiwan communist. Yes? No, but, okay, no, can I briefly answer you very yes. honestly? I see all your points. I, I agree with them, and, uh, but my point is this one, nonetheless. And now I want to ask you, if I may, Absolutely. a question. Absolutely. Yes. Okay, I know we exaggerate, and I'm well aware of, I emphasized it, do you remember, how easy it is to fall into this fascination by catastrophic prospect? Do you remember? No, you are not old enough. I am. Some of you must. Around 30, 40 years ago, most of Europe, especially Germany. I remember very well. No, was obsessed by Waldsterben yes, dying I of forest. And I remember the cover of Spiegel. They demonstrated exactly with statistics that 40, 50 years after that time, today, Europe will be without forests. I'm sad to tell you, but according to some statistics, today there are more forests in the world than at any point in the last 100 years. So I'm over aware of this fascination of catastrophe, but nonetheless, I think, and you can deny it, I will not, uh, when we communists take over, you will go to Gulag, but for different <laughs> reasons. <you know. laughs> Where will you go? You know what I, why I'm glad to talk with him? That, you know, in today's politically correct climate, in 
typical Western academic institution, you cannot talk like that, you know. <laughs> no, but seriously. But I nonetheless see these threats, and I could go on indefinitely, like digital control and so on. Things are serious there, the extent to which we are manipulated already and so on. Ecology, immigration. And did you notice, I'm not a simple humanitarian there. I just don't share this... This simple optimism, open on hearts and what? All the poor will move to Europe and whatever. So how, very simple question, I will try to cut myself short. How these three domains that I outlined, I think, at least in the long term, they need a more radical, something will have to happen. Do you, probably you don't agree. Do you see them as serious threats? Are you still a Fukuyamaist in the sense of we just make a system function a little bit better? I'm skeptical there. The threats you mention, I all see as serious. But ecology, keep in mind, the communist nations were the worst polluters uh, and still are. Yeah. Surveillance, the worst culprits. China, right? Not a fully communist nation. But nonetheless, surveillance is worst in China. No, I, if you're worried about genetic engineering and the reshaping of mankind... Biggest offender is likely to be China. No, I don't. Totally, I West. even know it may surprise you and the exact data. I was shown by a friend in suburb of Shanghai, already clinics. No, no, not okay. Sorry, I will not lose too much time. This yes. will interest you. I met years ago in Frankfurt Book Fair one high guy from Chinese Academy of Sciences, and he gave me printed in English the short program, programmatic note. And it says, it shocked me, literally, the goal of biogenetic in China is to regulate physical and psychic health of the Chinese nation. They are directly doing it. What I only don't like is, don't just evoke China as this ultimate horror. We are basically doing the same, I claim. Let me now get to my theory of you. Now, there's an old interview I read with you, and I found this passage quite striking. Quote, and sympathetic, I should add. The movies I watch are often old Stalinist movies. The songs that I listen to are old communist songs. Dot, dot, dot. I fully admit it, but it is also my pleasure. Now, also, you're from Slovenia. You're from the Balkans. That part of the world has not developed ideally there are mm. far-right parties in many places. There's been war. The Balkans are still mm. a disappointment. So there's a negative outlook on the world you're from. And I view your attachment to the communist label as a kind of nostalgia, like the old Stalinist songs, which you don't actually think are better than Beethoven. But it's some like the old East German women who love their Spreewald pickles, the old cars, the Trabis. And the communist label for you, it's like your Spreewald pickles, the Gorky. Uh, it's like the Trabi. And why not just cast it aside and live free? Why be so tied to your own nostalgia? That's my question. Okay, my counter question is then that obviously what I read today around are nonetheless, I'm more of a pessimist. You see, we are coming back to this basic dilemma. But you need this nostalgia, right? Why not free yourself by jettisoning the nostalgia? And take the next step. But, no, no. If I were okay, your therapist, I, this is okay. what I would be asking no, you to do. Okay, uh, let's go on. What, I don't want to lose your time, but what really fascinates me in Stalinism is uh, how, if you look at it closely, how fascinated Stalinism was by America, for example, do you know that that's why I like Soviet cinemas, <clears throat> that the absolute model of Soviet cinema was Hollywood. They had, des they had desperate plans in the 30s to build on crime, their own version of Hollywood, how they imitated Hollywood, and so on and so on. I claim that, you, you know, even explicitly, when Stalin was asked around 1930, his definition of a Bolshevik, he said, the one which combines Russian dedication to a sacred cause with American pragmatism, efficiency, and so on and so on. What, what, uh, uh, but you know, behind this, what you call nostalgia is for me, nonetheless, uh, it's much more traumatic if you want it. I am the first to admit, and that's my, maybe we share the opinion here, that's my criticism of 
one of the criticisms of Frankfurt School. As I always repeat, look at Habermas. At his work, he began publishing in early 50s. Read all his work, and I don't think you will even guess for, from his published text that there is something like communism in East Germany. Frankfurt School, in a strange way, almost totally, I know there is Marcuse's book, Soviet Marxism, but it's very specific. And you know what makes it so strange? The central thesis of late Frankfurt School is a dialectic of enlightenment. Horrors of 20th century, fascism, Stalinism, are not simply regressions to some dark past. They are Deployment of a certain totalitarian, whatever we call them, potentials in the project of modernity itself. Okay, uh, but isn't Stalinism a much more traumatic example of this than fascism? With fascism, things are relatively simple, I think. It's a model of conservative revolution and so on and so on. But Bolshevism, which tried to do a radical emancipation and it turned into a traumatic knife. I think even today we don't have a good theory of Stalinism. That's what bothers me. Not any return to it. I will give you as a proof that it's not in this sense nostalgia. I'll give you another example. I have such a memory. I always tell my friends jokes about life in the army. I served in the mid-70s in Yugoslav army. But you know, like, it was a nightmare. I know. But what fascinated me was I never did I learn so much about ideology and my politically correct friend. Don't. For example, I wonder if some of you know, you don't have here any more military service in Norway. But basically, on the one hand, Yugoslav army was, as all armies probably, absolutely homophobic. You were gay, you were beaten by fellow soldiers every night discreetly before being thrown out. But at the same time, Crucial, absolutely crucial. The entire life was totally penetrated by homosexual innuendos and so on. In my unit, we didn't say good morning. We say, I'll smoke your prick. Thanks, and after I finish with yours. So, you read this, this, all these paradoxes. What fascinates me about ideology is, and this where communism interests me, is how this is why Yugoslavia, which was relatively liberal communism, interests me. Do you know that in Yugoslavia, it wasn't just we have our own ideology, self-managed socialism. I mean this literally. Slovenia was a small country. We knew everybody else. Nomenklatura. It's sounding like more nostalgia to me. Army tales. We talked about smoking the prick, right? Okay, but, 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 uh, the lesson I learned there, I don't care if you call it nostalgia, the lesson I, and I will tell you where I see real nostalgia today. The lesson for me is how an ideology can function, not only even if you don't believe in it, but you, it is prohibited to believe in it. This was the beautiful paradox of ex-Yugoslavia. I had two friends who worked in the Central Committee of the Slovene Party. They lost their job. You know why? Because they were stupid and took the ruling ideology too seriously. But you know who are, for me, change the topic, but along the same line, the true nostalgics today. That's why I don't like the novel. This will again hurt some of you. Uh, Margaret Atwood, Handmaid's Tale. This is for me true nostalgia. It's what Frederick Jameson called nostalgia for the present. It paints this horrible near future. It doesn't raise the crucial question. But she's still too fascinated by our permissive societies and so on and so on. You know, for uh, sorry, these go are on. side issues. If I visit your debate with Jordan Peterson, it's on YouTube. I felt you won that debate, and it's striking yes. to me the discussion between one hour ten minutes and one hour eighteen minutes. And in that part of the discussion, you say that you calling yourself a communist is a bit of a provocation. But now I'd like to draw a comparison. Take the writer who just won the Nobel Prize in literature, Peter Handke, yes. right? Sometimes called an Austrian, but he's ethnic Slovene. Ha, he is mother. Ethnic. He has sympathized with the Serbian atrocities. Yeah. And you are hard on him, correctly so. You don't give him the space of that being a provocation. He is so close to your world 
that you apply a more absolutist moral standard and you want him to jettison his Serbian nostalgia and I am submitting that but communism... But I have no nostalgia. For what do I have nostalgia? I, I, my the God. attachment to the label communist. You can do everything you want without that word, no. without the concept, without having okay. to apologize Let's go step for the by step history. Hunt, okay. You know the old yeah. joke, what's the difference between a communist and a Nazi? Tenure, right? <laughs> you mean university tenure? Or yes, not? it's a joke, but the point is... <laughs> You no, I don't would, need communism. I think, you are much smarter okay, than let's communism. Go, let's go step by step. First, Handke. My yeah. criticism of him was very specific. And Even before he got involved into what he got involved to, I didn't like the game he played. Uh, for example, I remember his text from 30 years ago, 40 before, where he said... In Austria, everything is commodified. You go to a store, every brand of milk has a name. You cross the border to poor Slovenia. It just says milk with no brand name and so on. And what I hate is, we should agree even here. We what do. I call, through uh, borrowing the term of my friend, another Austrian philosopher, Robert Fowler, interpassive authenticity. You want to keep your, well, good life in the West, but you like to be authentic through others. This is why we were very good. He was proud to refer to us Slovenes, Handke, insofar as we were the modest poor communists. The moment we wanted our own state, join European Union, we betrayed his dream. That's why, maybe you know, in the text, I quote this wonderful saying by Gilles Deleuze, si vous êtes pris dans le rêve de l'autre, vous êtes foutu. If you are caught into another's dream. And that's, for me, we should agree here, the big problem of Western academic left. They're always searching for another place where things really happen. When I was young, it was Cuba. Then it was uh, a decade ago, Chavez, Venezuela, and so on and so on. No, nothing great happens elsewhere and so on. And to my third friend, I declare that they will see if they will succeed too well, he will betray them also. They will disappoint him. You know, this is what annoys me with Handke, if you, uh, if you ask me. But listen, talking about nostalgia, I'm sorry to tell you, but I'm not saying I was a great dissident. But now I will say something arrogant. If there are not some great dissidents from Eastern Europe here, then probably I can venture a hypothesis that I did more for the disappearance of East European communism than any of you in this room. I was for five years unemployed. I had to survive through parents and so on and so on. So I was there when it was needed and so on. And I'm even a little bit proud to say that the role I played at that time is that when you said we have problems, right-wing politicians, <laughs> yes, we also do it, but Slovenia is the only post-Yugoslav country where nationalists never took over. That we did. I was, at that time, it will shock you, member of a party called Liberal Democratic Party. And we did it. We, we pre but you know what, for me, the, uh, again, I return to that. Uh, I appreciate that, what okay, you but done please ask country, me that question. How case will we deal stronger. with ecology? You really think that with market, a little bit of that, it can be dealt? No, I we know. need much more than that. We need more. We don't know okay, what I do, call but... that more communism. You know why? People, idiots, tell me, not you. Uh, uh, <laughs> why, why don't you call it socialism? Everybody is a socialist today. Bill Gates says he's a socialist and so on. It's meaningless. Socialism basically means today you care for society. Hitler cared for society. I don't care. You know, I just want to signal that, as you nicely said now, something a little bit more radical will be needed. That's all I'm saying. Sometimes... I, I love your books. I've read more than half of them, which Crazy. is a lot. Crazy, madman, madman. Uh, your gulag <laughs> sentence is redoubled now. But one thing I crave is to one day just see you writing about a question like the electric tram in Bergen. Should it go through a tunnel or not? <laughs> and you would not be allowed to mention Fukuyama. You couldn't use the C word capitalism or communism. And just analyze that question or look at a municipal bus system in Denmark somewhere. And those to me are in some here, ways here more maybe real questions. We have a misunderstanding because I will tell you why not this. This may surprise you, the answer. Yes. First, you know, 
I tremendous, this was the point, you know, when in my short speech, short, <laughs> when I said I despise, for me, the model of catastrophe today is my friends, they cried, Takrir Square Syntagma. We were there, one million people, we were all crying, wonderful. I say F off. What <laughs> interests me, I hope we agree here, is what happens two months later. Sure. I'm, I'm all for this pragmatic, concrete problems. I'm not waiting for a big revolution. I just am, now this may surprise you for somebody who may sound so bomb bombastic and pretentious like me. You know, strange as it will sound, but I don't know everything. You know? <laughs> like, I'm immediately thinking in uh, literal terms what, what to do, so many factors. I don't know enough. I, I, I like these totally concrete empirical problems. I like paradoxes. For example, would you agree very briefly, maybe you found this in one of my books. I'm not quoting this as an argument for anti-capitalism. I don't know that. But there are some group experiments which fascinate me, which proves that you cannot reduce some forms of solidarity to money. A Jewish friend from Israel told me this. They had a kindergarten there, and... Uh, this story is apocryphal. People have tried to follow up on the kindergarten in Israel story. It's probably not true. Really? Yes. Are we talking about one when they made it, when they made pay even yes, less? Yes, we're, we're not sure this is true. I've looked into Really? This. It's possibly true. It cannot be confirmed. But I, I accept the point. Yes, yeah, the, the, the point is that price, I believe it surprisingly. I, and uh, when I talk <clears throat> about communism and so on, my God, I've written texts on it, and now I go on into it. Into, for me, communism is just as I emphasize, and the name of a problem is not a solution. I, you know, now I, I will say something that will shock you. I'm well aware. Oh, some of my communist friends admitted that even if we imagine something similar to communism, the mega problem will be envy and so on. And this is, who is one of the great guys, my God, the one who conducted Chile according to leftist mythology, not Pinochet, the economist, uh, free market, uh, who advised Pinochet according... Arberger. No, 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 the big guy, the... Sorry? I think he only visited once or no, twice. No, 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 I, I, that was not my it. point. But one of those guys, when reproached with the fact that uh, but capitalism is unjust, you work harshly, you fail, your neighbor was there, he said, but that's why capitalism works. Because he said, your pride survives intact. Let's say we are two guys. We live in a just society. And if there is no luck and injustice, this means if you are richer than me, I have to admit that I'm more stupid than you. But capitalist injustice, it's a very elegant argument. Communism is easy in a way. You always have an excuse, right? Yes. The system screwed you. That's why. And you're always now right. Now I will ask you, this is my big argument <laughs> against happiness. Do you agree if you are now like my Stasi observer, you have your list? Of yes. Five. You remember when I argue about happiness against? Yes. I take as an example, and I was there, I talked with people. Husaks, Czechoslovakia in the 70s. Material needs were basically satisfied. Nobody was doing that. And as you said, you always had an excuse. There was too much rain or drought. Communists screwed it up. Then, very important, you had a nearby country, West Germany, which was the ideal other, but it was not too far away and so on. That's why I'm against happiness. Happiness means no responsibility, relatively comfortable life, you know. Because after, already after Khrushchev, basically, with Brezhnev, you must know this, communists in power made a pact with population. They admitted we will never reach the West, but the message was, you leave us political power, we leave you your private niche where you can enjoy your life, and so on and so on. I think that Khrushchev was paradoxically, don't you agree, the last guy who somehow 
paradoxically, you know, he was sincere in that, you must know it, United Nations speech where he, yeah, he, the last epoch where the ruling nomenclatura has still believed in communism. After that, it's a totally different logic of emancipation. Some of the communists in power, I love this in Yugoslavia, even referred to Marcuse Frankfurt School, they said, but you know, in the West, you have commodification, alienation. Here, you can take it easy, it's more poor, and so on, and so on. You know, sorry, let I me, talk too much. Let me praise you some more. No! All your, no, yes, all your no. books I've read, one of my favorite things in the books is yes. how much humor you have, and in yeah, person, for this, I whether will speaking do, yeah. or over breakfast... For this, I will share your selling gulag, probably. Your, your humor, <laughs> which is based on insight, right, rather than any Youngman type of jokes... Uh, is phenomenally good. But here's what strikes me. You have the humor of a right-winger, of a right-wing moderate. So if you think of today's left, it is increasingly humorless. You're not allowed to talk about so many things. On gender, your views are much more right-wing than left-wing. That's debatable. So I don't know what to is yeah. moving. When I sit down with my right-wing friends and they joke around, their jokes are in broad terms like yours, left wing. Oh, oh, my humor. answer to this, not no, humor is of you, above it's a very politics. simple one. My, my answer to this is that's why the, the, uh, the politically correct leftists are doing all possible to get Trump reelected, if you ask me. F a little bit more years on this and we will be where we are. But let me add, as a sign of friendship to you, yes. another bad taste humor about you. <laughs> you are, my friend, I like you. So when we communists take over, yes. uh, <laughs> nonetheless, because you are objectively guilty, you go to Gulag. Okay. But as a special favor to you, you know what you got on better days in Gulag, on Saturday? Some kind of disgusting soup, entrails and heads, half rotten fishes and sure. potato. Maybe some bread in it. Don't exaggerate. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I will call from my Moscow center. Yes. And isn't it nice? You will get two plates of that soup. <laughs> so do, you you get... do you agree you have an increasingly right-wing sense of humor and that if we're going to be... But why do we call it right-wing? When I was young, to this was left-wing humor. Of it is no longer left-wing humor. The world has then moved so on. Then so much for the left. For the worse. Okay. We're making progress. Maybe. You are indeed the moderate right communist Nostalgia, rum state, communist, who is maybe almost ready to abandon that final bit of the nostalgia. Don't count on that too much, because <laughs> I still think that the crisis will hit us. I, I see signs. They, here comes my pessimism. I think that the situation today with new right wing, blah, 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 and here, as we already talked about it, I'm very open. For example, do they exist here? Not. We talked about it, so-called incels. Involved celibaters. Usually they decry it as the worst. Women hating fascists. No, they do something, I think, almost tragic. They try to turn their failure. And already this is politically incorrect to state today. You cannot address a woman almost it's prohibited saying she's beautiful. You cannot say to a man, you are non-attractive enough, you cannot get any woman. But that's their experience. And I admire how, without any imminent violence, they turn this into a wonderful performance, especially clown cells and so on. It's a wonderful way to survive a pretty terrifying predicament. And I don't buy that they are automatically neo-fascists and so on. Concerning feminism, and by reproach to me too, is not they are too radical and so on. But it's an upper middle class fake. The American feminism should first do, I hope we agree here, a little bit of a good old-fashioned Stalinist, you will say again, nostalgia, <laughs> self-criticism. You know, there are so many things of American feminism. Do you know, for example, they supported American invasion of Iraq, that it will help women? Well, we know today that the situation of women today in Iraq is much worse than under Saddam. Saddam was an brutal despot, but relatively secular. This is what bothers me. Second problem, you will again say I'm conservative here. Fuck it, I don't care. <laughs> the problem with political correctness is for me that 
questions, which are questions of, uh, not manners in a superficial sense, but of customs. Here I am, as you know, a Hegelian. Hegel always emphasized the basis that holds society together are unwritten rules, customs, and so on. Political correctness tried too much to legalize it, you know. You are allowed to call this name. For example, let me give you a provocative example, you know, it to, to provoke you. Once I problematize this idea of consent, even bureaucratic consent. You have to state it on a selfie sign before mutual agreement. And they say, oh, so I think we can rape women. We don't need consent. They totally misread me on the opposite. I just claim consent in itself is good, better than nothing. But it doesn't solve the problem. There is so much pressure, violence, which can survive the form of consent. Even if there is a formal consent, sexual exploitation can go on and so on and so on. My problem with LGBT+, plus, as if I'm attacking them, no. The problem I see there, I wonder if you agree, is this one. I have a problem with identity politics. The problem is that the idea of predominant, there are many LGBT+, plus who are extremely good theorists, uh, persons. But the predominant view is the one of this one. I simplify it. There is some kind of a multiplicity of gender positions, flurry thing. It's almost the Maoist version. You know, let the 100 flowers blossom. Let 100 uh, boots, gender, bisex, trisex. And then evil patriarchy comes, imposes the binary division. Let's get rid of these, and some of them even establish a list. 30, 35 positions. My God, and then they say Freud is outdated. If there is anything to learn from Freud, is that sexuality is in itself antagonist, traumatic, shady domains, and so on and so on. That's my first point. My, so it's as if, what bothers me in LGBT plus is as if, if we get rid of social pressure, we are, we get some kind of happy sexuality. The first presupposition that I adopt here is because you do what you desire. My God, didn't they read Freud? How do you know that you really desire what you think that you desire? There are all the ambiguities here. My second problem, and that's the theoretical one. Let's move into Hegel a little bit. Maybe you know my line. LGBT plus, it's all about plus, no? Because the ordinary LGBT theorists are for me two British empiricists. Plus is for them simply, maybe we don't yet know all identities, let's leave it open. You know, like maybe there will be other gender identities, we will include them. No. As I got this, I forgot her name, I'm sorry, from an Australian LGBT theorist, very intelligent lady, who wrote to me, but what if plus itself is a subjective position? You can be a plus in the sense of, you know, at a distance, doubting. And I think this is feminine position at its stronger. I will go to absolutely everyday level. That's why the most provocative woman's answer is, why do you love me? Because you... there is no answer to this question. The moment you answer it, it's not true love by definition. If I tell you why I love you, then it becomes matter of... You know, so what I'm saying is that I just try to complicate things. Why not move to Singapore? Yeah. It's a wonderful country. And yes. if you ask which nation has the quality of government and the thoughtfulness yeah. and the long time horizon to actually deal with ecological problems, are they not near or at the top of the list? And therefore, you and I can join hands in embracing Singapore and presenting it to the world? You know, a, here a, I, I may be but too pretty good Marxist, but isn't it that Singapore nonetheless enjoys its role as a structural an exception? I don't think you can expand Singapore to Indonesia. Already with Malaysia there are problems and so on and so on. Well, every country is different, but clearly Singapore no, no, has stronger worked, there. Because, right? you know, I, I read somewhere that Singapore port is, even at some point it was the busiest port in the world and so on which means they are kind of a nodal point for the countries around them and so on. I doubt. Second thing, maybe I have here too much liberal sensitivity. 
But nonetheless, you know, it's a kind of a, the way I would define Singapore, you may disagree, is, is fascism with a human face. A very human face, it's consensual and so on, but there are so strict limits, even at the everyday ridiculous level. For example, I was there with my son who wanted some chewing gum. We went to a store and they laughed at me. Are you crazy? You have to go to pharmacy. We went to a pharmacy. They said, okay, where do you have doctor's prescription? I said, no. I'm, uh, But this is fine. This is not fascism. Singapore did that because too many people were leaving the chewing gum on the subway doors and it was creating a problem. Maybe yeah, they yeah, overreacted. Yeah, yeah. Now you are exactly right. Your criticism of Singapore no, is about it, the no, chewing no, no, gum. No, what I, I say, say, come join me at the food stalls, right? Where? In Singapore? Yeah, I know where all the best ones are, right? Jump yeah. on board, forget the communist thing. The nostalgia can be for Singapore 13 years ago, which in some ways was less crowded, right? It's a better no, nostalgia. No, 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 but, but again, don't you see where my communism comes? Seriously. It's precisely, I, it's not where you think, I don't think there is any link with me clinging to the name communism and my nostalgia. Those times, I'm well aware, were more or less a nightmare, I mean. I'm, listen, one reason against nostalgia is that I was jobless. Although, you may know this joke, something wonderful happened. When people ask me which was the key factor for your relative success in the West, I told them communist oppression. Because I applied for a job when I finished my postdoctoral doctoral studies in 1973, and this was the harsh line. I couldn't get the job. And then I was for a couple of years unemployed. I was looking for contact in the West. Without communist oppression, I would have been now an unknown professor in the city of Ljubljana, Slovenia. As Sometimes you remind me of Leibach, the Slovenian rock group. They're, they're my friend, my God. I, I'm of with course. them from late, from late 80s. Yes. And now things get complicated there. You know why? Because many leftists who support them are nonetheless afraid. Of course. Okay, they are staging totalitarian rituals. What if some people will take it seriously and so on? And once But, they were asked, are you a fascist? And one of them said, I am a fascist like Hitler was a painter. What answer is that? I don't know. <laughs> But... Why can't they just say, I'm not a fascist? And then you could say, I'm not a communist. And you and Leibach, and we could all meet in the food stalls of Singapore. No. Taiwan, <laughs> have a nice time, right? Work on better batteries so solar power can really save us. We could have the government subsidize, you know, better battery technology. I know it's not all we need to do, but... And no, then no, think no. about that no, electric no, no. tram Sorry, and the tunnel, another diesel from thing. the cruise ships. I can tell harbor. you from my personal contact with Leibach yes. that they don't mean it as an ironic spectacle. They are very serious in their harsh line. That's what I like about them. They are not, don't be afraid, we are not really totalitarians. It's just one big social game and so on and so on. But at a certain point, I didn't want to join them because they wanted me, you probably know, two years ago when they went to... Uh, North Korea. North Korea. No, it would be too much. Sure, of course. I, I didn't want to too do Too communist it. for you. Yeah. <laughs> no, but nonetheless, you know what was so interesting with Leibach? Here you have the complexity of ideological process that all this fear, will they be manipulated by radical right and so on, they never were, whenever they are popular, It's they never the right. Vision. I know what the right wingers, at least in Europe, are listening. It's not uh, the German version of Leibach. There was some influence. Do you know Rammstein, the sure. group? Links, links. They are left, and it's a beautiful, the right thing to do for the left to appropriate this horrible totalitarian-sounding stuff, and so on, and so on. The right wingers that I know, they think beautiful, romantic songs, apolitical usually, and so on and so on. But still, you know where you, I get your point, of course. I still, when you said no, something more will be needed. F you, what more? Tell me. <laughs> You say, no, 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 it's not, I know, ecology and so on, digital control. Can you any idea what, what more will be needed? What do you think, that ecological was, party will be elected? I hope so, maybe. I That's was told why in Bergen, like, it's 20% electric cars. Now, I don't know what Bergen did to <laughs> get that. But many parts of the world could learn from whatever has been done here. And we're no, at you, 20, I, uh, let's work yeah. for 60, right? 
Yeah, but uh, on the other hand, my only not criticism of Norway is that you have oil, gas, and so on. You know, you can. Of course, we can. I would like to learn from <laughs> Norway, but I would like even more if you give me your natural resources. You know? To <laughs> earn from the oil and then divest from fossil fuels. Although I have Mr. one Maya, argument for strange. you here, the good thing about Singapore is that they have no natural resources. No. Well, they do a lot of refining there. So refining, yes, yes. but no, no. Uh, not that I'm aware of. But what what made made it? Is it kind of a one incidental conjunction? That what I would have maybe said about Singapore of uh, this Chinese proclivity to hard work and English legislation, or what? There must have been some unique combination there. Keep in mind, the Chinese themselves felt at first that the Chinese who went to Singapore were kind of the losers who were not doing well in China, the poorly educated peasants. But the Singaporean government thought, let's invest in human capital. When? Which government? I'm talking Lee about Lee Kuan Yew. Yes. Yeah. And it worked for the most part. But what's then your problem with China? Because do you know, you must know this, that at the beginning of <laughs> history forums, Deng Xiaoping came to Singapore. And Everybody, he, everywhere there, they saw it and said Singapore should be a model for... It is time for China to liberalize. I don't see them doing that. They seem to be moving in the opposite direction. Here and uh, now we touch the true problem. Sorry, now I'm not losing time. <laughs> you know where I am a pessimist? Some of my liberal friends tell me, oh, China achieved so much with full political liberalization, they would have achieved even more. I doubt it. We don't know the counterfactual. Speaking of counterfactual, I, I have them. a question for you about Donald Trump. Yeah. So you initially said, well, if Trump wins, it could be good because it will revitalize the left. He did. There was then another, he did uh, another yeah. article where they, people asked you, did you really mean it? And you said maybe a year ago, yes. But I look at the Democratic race. Front runner number one is Joseph Biden, age, I think, 77. Yeah. He was vice president for yeah. eight years. Mayor Pete is now number two because he took a moderate stance. Sorry, who is name? Mayor Pete, Buddha judge. I'm so sorry. I don't know, know how to pronounce that name. That's I, I'm not sure I do either. But he, he, he's mayor from South Bend, Indiana. Yeah. To me, you know, yeah. a, a perfectly fine candidate. And the Democratic conservatives are in the ascendancy. And where the Democrats have gone hard left is identity politics. And that's exactly the thing you hate. So why has it been good? The we Democrats, have three years of Trump, maybe blah, 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 eight blah, blah, years blah. of okay. Trump. We don't have time to go it, but let me be specific. Democrats who go for identity politics, already Hillary tried this against Donald Trump. Yes, and that oh, was sorry, much sorry. more radical. Against, against Bernie Sanders. Sure. That's why I admire Alessandria Ocasio-Cortez, who said something very ingenious. You must have read it. Who, who said... Uh, recently endorsing Bernie Sanders, I endorsed him not in spite of him being an old white man, but because. Her idea was this one. Bernie Sanders can get us, we don't need, dem center Democrats are obsessed, if you go too much to the left, we lose this centrist vote and so on. Trump did exactly the opposite. I think the target of the Democratic Party should be those impoverished white Half unemployed workers who otherwise would have voted for Trump, not those middle of the road and so on and so on. Trump is a genius here, how he broke all the rules and so on. Because do you remember how often in his campaign when he said something, I know, preposterous, horrible, liberal press said, oh, Trump just shot himself, he's over and so on. No, it's not over. Trump proved that sometimes the only way to majority is through extremes. It's not always that sense. Works. But I worry here there's a parallel, your views and pronouncements on Trump and on communism. So in the case of Trump, you think, well, I can say this, I have a vision that work, will work out a particular way, the democratic left will be revitalized, but, but what we've we gotten is the Maybe, worst of the They left. may lose, the identity politics, revitalized. And the moderates are on the rise. And then there's a sense of, well, I can attach myself to communism, I have a particular theory, that will work out some way, it will tell us we always need more when it comes to ecology. But that to me seems like the Trump prediction. We know from the work of Philip Tetlock, it's just very hard to predict the future. So why not I, stand up directly for just the right values? Like take Greta Thunberg, right? I don't agree with everything she says, but her core message is correct. She is unambiguous. She's to the point. Yeah. It's not I ironic. Yeah. There's okay. not some okay. complicated exactly. theory. She is the contemporary communist for me. Fully. You He's know why? No, but you know what? I know. Forget. You know what I like about her? Magnus Carlson okay. is a communist. But you know what, what, what I like about Greta Thunberg? First, you remember some media in Europe tried to blame her parents, you know. 
they are manipulating her. My answer was, I hope they do. I hope. Why shouldn't we, the left, also manipulate? But what I like is precisely, I didn't like her at the beginning, you remember, when she played that innocent girl who uh, is telling us that the emperor is naked. But did you notice how in the last year of men, she has this almost a little bit of diabolic, uh, aggressive <laughs> smile. I like the mean Greta Thunberg. I don't like the good, innocent girl. And I also referred to her, you know, for me, she is deeply feminine, but not the usual notion of femininity promoted by the media today. Holistic dialogue. Uh, no, no, no. She is quite dogmatic, insistent. That's what we need today. And I don't need anything more. Okay, we can debate the name, but I think that, that what she is doing is definitely Communists today are for me, Greta Thunberg, Assange, and so on. Incidentally, do you know the story? I must repeat it to you. I hope all of you don't know it. When I visited him two weeks ago in prison. It's wonderful. I couldn't believe it. I'm sorry if some of you know it. I was sitting close to him like this in open space at the table. A friend brought me a cup of coffee, a plastic cover. I took the cover off and drank some coffee and put coffee back on the table, in two seconds, literally, a guard was there, very gentle, soft, no terror, just said, please, sir, put the cover, plastic cover back on the coffee. I asked afterwards, I didn't want to cause problems there, why? They told me, you were sitting opposite a son and evil man, it was for my own good, they told me, they wanted to block the possibility that evil men like Assange will grab the boiling coffee and throw it into my face and so on. It's, no, but I think, okay, you these like are my heroes. You today. like alternate scenarios, right? No, there is no alternate I, I'd like it's Greta to tell us, exists. what's the alternate scenario where you write books which are not so much pastiche, not so much bringing together of disparate elements, but you become a kind of realistic non-Hegelian preacher almost, like Greta Thunberg, return somewhat to your Catholic roots, embrace your right moderate side, retire in Singapore, and go gallivanting if off I will, no, to the first, food stalls uh, uh, uh. where you, we share your sense of humor with my right-wing no, friends. First, first, what does that alternative scenario Singapore, look like? It's Ecuador, it's too hot for me. <laughs> if I retire, Singapore. if I retire, and I'm not lying to you now, two, three times I've written about it. I want to retire to the part of Norway, which is not even Norway. I'm not kidding. I wrote about it. It's my ideal place. Longyear Bien Svalbard Island. <laughs> That's my ideal place. It's half empty, nothing there, and it's very good prospects for survival, because you know the joke. It's prohibited to die there. <laughs> because... But last question. No, 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 but the quite serious. The scenario where, where you evolve in this manner, with your right-wing sense of humor... What does that look like? Why do like? you call what it has right to happen? It's the humor of my youth. My yes, God. thank you. What has to happen for that scenario to come about? I'm not saying it will happen, but what does that science fiction world look like? What would you but have to first, see in the world? I will tell you... Did, no, no, I'm not trying to make cheap propaganda for myself. But I did try to practice this. You know what? One of my books, which was not full failure, but close to a failure, my... Rewriting of Antigone. Did you read that no, one? No, I have not read that ah, one. I love that one. You know what I did? <laughs> I took, it's precisely alternate scenario. I took, and you will not like the third version, I took Antigone. But you should like it because it's very pragmatic. I took first, it, it, it's pure alternate logic, like Kislovsky's film and that uh, Lola runs and so on. First, I took the way the story you have in Sophocles, which incidentally is not the original story. The original Greek myth is totally different. Okay, you know what happens. I will not repeat them. Then, at the moment of her big conflict in the middle of the play with, uh, with Creon, I play alternate reality. She wins. Creon says, okay, you are right. Let's allow the burial. In my scenario, what happens is that as Creon suspected, there is, again, a revolt, again, a traitor. The whole of Tibet, the city, is in ruin. And at the end of the second version, he walks desperate in the city and uh, cries like that famous, you know, hit line of Antigone. I was created for love, not for 
war, death, and the chorus answers her, fuck you, big, but that's what you created. Then comes the third version. Last word is for you, but you have 38 seconds, so you okay, okay, yeah. The third version that you will like, I hope, is while Creon and Antigone are fighting, the chorus steps over, said, you are both traitors, Uh, ruining the city, you should both be liquidated, and they establish a kind of Jacobin terror, and they're both liquidated. Nobody likes this. I don't. Lavoie, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> but don't you suspect me? I still have zero seconds. But don't you suspect me? How come that you don't have? Don't you trust me? That fear that now I'm talking soft, but if I get too close to power. You will see the Stalin inside of me. You don't suspect me of really being a bad guy. You no, trust me. I don't. I think your attachment and almost obsession with plenitude and being What's generative. What's plenitude? Pl of ideas. Uh, yeah, ideas. Yeah, the yeah, sense yeah, yeah, in yeah, which yeah. you are generative, which is a personality feature and a temperament and neurological in you, that that so overwhelms whatever oppressive tendencies you might have, that if you were appointed dictator of whatever, you would just go off and write more books, and you can't help it. And I yeah, admire here, this. Here, I am in some sorry, ways I will tell you a story, very brief one. Don't be afraid. No time. That's what I like. And even, I hope you will like this. In Mar My favorite passage in Marx is, maybe you know it, 1870, Paris Commune, There was a dream that maybe there will be a European revolution. And Marx wrote a letter to Engels, I love him for that, <laughs> where he says, oh my God, they want a revolution now, but, but I haven't yet finished the capital, <laughs> not now, I have to finish my book. That's the true spirit that I love. Exactly, <laughs> and that's why I trust you. Yeah. Now, we have a method for questions. There will be questions from the floor and questions from Twitter. Your questions from the floor are to be questions, not statements, not proclamations, not political platforms. We are here to hear this man, so I will cut you off if it is not a proper question. But before we get to that, we have four questions on video, at least one of which is too long, and I'm told they're your friends, but you need more enemies, perhaps. Yeah, absolutely. I'm well, sincere First, we start here, yes. with those questions. Let's get to those. But how will we? And then will questions hear from the them floor, or how? and well. the microphones will come around, and it will all be managed efficiently, because this is Bergen, Norway. <laughs> questions from the video. First video, please. My line of questioning for Slavoj has to do with the Marxist critique of political economy. First, in relation to Marx's historical materialism, uh -huh. do you think there have been any major changes in the basic relations between economic infrastructure and more than economic superstructure in capitalism between the mid-19th century and today? Has the role or weight of the economy in shaping social history altered over this period? Second, if you were to rewrite Marx's critical rendition of economics for the 21st century, what components of it would you prioritize updating, revising, scrapping, or replacing? What would be some of the distinctive features of your own contemporary critique of political economy? They are all my friends. I know who will be, so I will... On the other hand, these are difficult theoretical questions. We need another two hours. I would just say that, yes, I agree with, I cannot go into it now, with uh, Adrian's point how the relationship between ideology, economic infrastructure change, and so on and so on. But all I can do now is point out what he knows and most of us know, that already in Marx, and that's one of the critical points that we need to read Marx, what I really admire in Marx, because it's not what you idiots, not you personally, but think, <laughs> It's his theory of commodity fetishism. It's not simply we believe in fetishes. Not, no, the Marxist theory is that we, bourgeois subjects, in our actual life, we are usually pragmatic Anglo-Saxon utilitarians. The fetishist inversion is in how we act. Our reality is structured. Marx has a wonderful theory where it's not this enlightenment vision, you know. We dream illusions, the other thing is real life. No, we can be very, to repeat a joke that I'm sure you all know, but it renders perfectly the point. Uh, you know, that story that I always repeat, Niels Bohr and the horseshoe. You know, Niels Bohr had a horseshoe at his country house across the entrance door, superstitious item, and a friend asked me, why do you have it there? Aren't you a scientist? Do you believe in it? You know what's Niels Bohr's answer? Of course I don't believe in it. 
But I have it there because I was told that it works even if you don't believe in it. <laughs> That's how ideology works today. At this level, the extent, and maybe you would agree with this, the lesson of Marx is that, that's why, interestingly enough, commodity fetishism, he never calls it ideology. Because it's something very strange. It is a system of beliefs and so on, but objectifies central part of infrastructure itself. Along those lines, I would say, we have to go further than Marx, and so on and so on. I don't want to... Second video question, please. My question's about communism. So, along with Alain Badiou, you are one of the philosophers who reinvigorated the philosophical discussion of the idea of communism with a series of books and conferences and events. And so I'm wondering about your thinking about that project and the potential for communism now. I'm also thinking about your um, editions of collected works of Lenin, um, different um, volumes that you've produced um, with Lenin's works, and, in, and some of your um, events, also your event with um, Jordan Peterson. And so my sense is that uh, for the most part, you work within the um, communist tradition in addition to Hegel and Lacan, but yet sometimes it seems like your position is that every part of the 20th century experience has to be um, erased, has to be forgotten, has to be um, overcome, that we go back to the beginning and we don't need to use anything that we learned in the 20th century. At other times it seems like you're precisely actually um, learning from the 20th century and using some of the writings of Lenin and the achievements of, and the examples from European history in the 20th century. So I'm hoping that you might clarify how you see the potential for communist politics today, right? Not just communist philosophy, but communist politics today, what kind of organizational forms that you think it requires, and whether or not there really is a potential in communist movement. Maybe another way to say this is, how do you imagine the end of capitalism? Again, another two hours <laughs> answer question. Uh, uh, what I would say is that Looked close, first, I didn't, Michael, I'm not crazy, I'm, I didn't edit collected works of Lenin, I haven't <laughs> read them, never. What interested me is Lenin at a very precise moment. What fascinates me in Lenin, and I said this in both of my introductions to some texts, that uh, first, Lenin's time is over. I don't play the boring Trotskyite game of you know, this crazy dream. Oh, if only Lenin were to survive two years longer, he would have made a pact with Trotsky, Stalin would be sidestep, and so on. No, the deadlock was there from the beginning. So, but what interests me in Lenin, and maybe that's what we need today, is this totally pragmatic, voluntarist spirit. Isn't it clear that in 1917, it was a total mess, Lenin, often didn't know what to do. Uh, some even liberal communists praise his state and revolution. But what he says there is something that he immediately abandoned then. What interests me is especially Lenin in 21, 22, and this was the big failure of the October Revolution. They want the civil war. And then it would have been my moment, okay, now it's everyday life, invent new forms if you can. They failed. But... Uh, Lenin was at least the one who, he said openly, our situation is totally desperate. We don't have any formula. He didn't have any trust in the future. He, he saw this total openness. That's what fascinates me, but I'm not preaching in any sense the return to it. So my idea, unfortunately, I'm here maybe a little bit more, let's call it, pessimist. I really think, and incidentally, in this metaphor of returning to zero level, I quote Lenin, who wrote in 21, 22, a wonderful text, where he said, we, nothing worked. Then he said, it's not that we should stabilize our achievements, <laughs> but we should return to the zero level, begin from nowhere. And Quoting data, which also you mentioned, the horrible, uh, the, the fact that the only livable 
communism today, communism in the formal sense, the Chinese one, means ecological problems, more digital control, and so on and so on. We have to begin in some sense from the zero. Lenin already did this not just as a good direction. If you are a dogmatic Marxist, you can show that Lenin totally overturned Marx and so on. In this sense, Lenin was not the one of the fidelity to Marx. He pretended to be, but you know how religious revolutions also work. All great revolution proclaims itself return to origins. Martin Luther, the greatest original, oh, we just want to return to the original <laughs> Bible and so on. So, no, I think, again, that with all objective study and so on, see the good, bad sides, but the 20th century communism was ultimately a failure, an third, absolute failure. Third video question, please. Hi Slavoj, Paul Taylor here. Hope life's treating you well. My question relates to the role of academics as independent critical thinkers. In my experience within the UK sector at least, academics over the years when confronted with a growing bureaucracy, growing commercialism, have behaved like lemming type creatures or quizlings, to use a couple of references your Norwegian audience will be familiar with. <laughs> And given Brexit as a recent example, there's very little genuine debate over all the complicated topics around leaving the EU or not leaving, as the case may be. And there's a level of conformity and groupthink that reminds me of uh, the movie Stepford Wives, if that rings a bell with you. So my question to you is, you've experienced Yugoslav communist system and you've experienced something of the UK academic system, which of those environments do you think is most conducive to genuine, critical, engaged intellectuals? Thanks. Uh, it's a very nice question, and again, you will accuse me of nostalgia, <laughs> but I would say in the last decade, 1980s, Yugoslavia was better. You know why? There was not yet a total economic fiasco, and that was the beauty. From 1980, at least, maybe 82, the ruling nomenclatura were already preparing for the fiasco. So, actually, I think that some of the governments in different republics were pretty good. You know why? Because they knew they don't have democratic legitimacy. So they tried to do to learn some legitimacy. Think, for example, a very sad story. In mid-80s or 67, a gay organization formed itself in Slovenia. Immediately, a delegate from Central Committee came there. Yes, you are progressive. We are for them. Do you want financial support? And so on and so on. Then we got democracy, 1990. The first thing that the city town council, whatever, dominated by conservatives, is abolish all help to this gay organization. So in some paradoxical sense, it was a golden era, I would say, the second half, but I don't have any illusions. It's not that communists were good or so on. But communists in power knew they were fighting for survival. This is incidentally also how I read the explosion of nationalism. Milosevic got this. The communist nomenclatura had a problem. Democracy is coming. How to regain some type of democratic legitimacy without cancelling themselves as nomenclatura. The answer, obvious, was paint yourself as a defender of national interest and so on, nationalism and so on. On the other hand, I must say, what makes me so depressive, and the United States are big enough, are not the worst, but especially UK, I don't know how it is here, it's this pragmatic turn of philosophy has to serve concrete social needs. Labour Party, more than Thatcher, began this in England. My friend philosopher are telling me, you got Labour representatives coming to university philosophy department and say, we will give you more money, but we will just match it if you get some money from uh, private companies and so on and so on. But what I like about today's, I think, this is certainly not a traditional leftist idea, that What's good about academia is precisely that it's a space with no 
concrete attachment to any needs of society. You can go crazy, you can freely debate, and so on and so on. And this is more and more difficult today. Even in Germany, they are telling me. My good friend, conservative but bright, Peter Sloterdijk, he told me to get more money, you know what he likes to do? Business weekends. Years ago, he went for a weekend to uh, Volkswagen top managers and explain them, you know, this bullshit, what's going on today, postmodernity, the situation, <laughs> and so on, and God, I didn't ask. So what I'm saying is that this reminds me in an uncanny way to the worst years in ex-Yugoslavia, 70s of the communist oppression. This focus on also human sciences has to work for society, experts solve problems. No, we don't need that today. We need precisely academia, humanities in their useless character. The, the only, also in sciences, I think, if you look closely, isn't it that practically all big inventions, as far as I can judge, emerge either in a totally contingent external way, usually some military contract, or as a private hobby and so on. So what I advise you if you are here at the university is don't believe in this mantra of you are here, bourgeois spending money, hard-earned workers' money, and so on, uh, be more useful. No, what's great about university is they are not useful in the immediate sense. That's what we should expect from you academics. All great things, again, to use the guy whom you mentioned this morning, uh, how do, John Elster. Yes. He had this wonderful term years ago of states which are necessary a byproduct. It just comes, you cannot plan it. Academia should be a place for this. Last video question, please. Hi, Savoy from Australia. Huh? Send my greetings. You've often spoken critically of the Hölderlin paradigm, where the danger lies, there grows the saving power the idea that disaster harbors the seeds of its own overcoming the catastrophe provides both the negative index and even the opportunity for redemption. It's a model of historical catastrophe or crisis that's often associated with a kind of dialectical salvage along pseudo-Hegelian lines. I'm saying pseudo-Hegelian because you've done so much to argue that Hegel himself resists this kind of negative eschatology. But you've often suggested that Marx falls prey to this way of thinking. One of your criticisms of this paradigm and is that it exaggerates or misconstrues the exceptionality of the present and misunderstands the nature of the crisis and of crisis. Specifically, it underestimates the capacity of capitalism to absorb and feed on its own crises. Can we still hold to the idea of capitalism as being its own grave digger? Can you elaborate your critique of the Hölderlin paradigm in the light of the present when we can see the, the danger, the ravaging effects of global capitalism all around us to the extent that maybe danger itself is not the word we can use any longer? and where previous models of crisis seem not to hold. Specifically, and here's my, my question, is there a concept of revolution in the present context that does not fall prey to this paradigm? Uh, again, it's a mega difficult question. Just to explain to you, you know what she, uh, Rebecca Comey, incidentally, here I am a sincere, not politically uh, correct uh, feminist. I'm organizing next October in New York a big Hegel conference. The majority will be women. And I already brutally apologize to people. No, no, I'm not politically correct feminist. It's simply that the best Hegelian studies come from women today. So, okay, so Helderlin paradigm, you know this uh, passage from Helderlin, the general romantic poem, all the time quoted by Heidegger, wo das Gefahr ist, wächst das rettende Aux, where the danger is the greatest, the point of salvation is also near and so on. And this is a model for the usual revolutionary thinking, even in Marx, proletariat, zero level exploitation, poverty, but there is a chance that you 
turned around into salvation. I'm here a Hegelian, if you ask me. I much more believe, and I will not go into it now, it's another half an hour, how do I apply this to what I was telling about catastrophes, apocalypses, and so on, the post-apocalyptic vision. Hegel's problem is exactly the opposite one. The big attempt at liberation happened, French Revolution, and for Hegel, I don't totally agree with him, but nonetheless, it turned wrong, Jacobin terror, and so on. So, what went wrong? Hegel is not a crazy optimist. As bad as things are, you should see a chance for the better. No. Hegel's basic insight is exactly the opposite one. No matter how good an idea or a project is, we can be sure that it will be somehow, <laughs> that it will turn wrong somehow. And I think what Hegel did to French Revolution, we should do to 20th century communism. First, we have to still, we disagree here maybe, uh, I still see some tremendous utopian emancipatory potential, but it went terribly wrong with Stalinism and so on. And we shouldn't play these cheap games just corrupted Stalin or even... Did you notice how Marxists are often even racist here? They put the blame on Russia is too close to Asia. So it's Asiatic barbarism which is responsible for it. No, it things went wrong. And we have to begin thinking from this. What's then the solution? Simply return to more modest previous model of society. This is my vision today. Yes, we are approaching a crisis, but we cannot simply revitalize the 20th century communism. We, can, we should rethink it radically. I'm, again, a Hegelian, a Hegelian pessimist here. Hegel is, for me, a thinker of deep distrust. Hegelian dogma is everything turns wrong, so only the whole delicate Hegelian theory of repetition, only the second time, to do it again, you have to do it again. Maybe you have a chance the second time if you learn the lessons of the first time. And I think that's what we need today. This much more modest spirit. Don't wait for a big revolution. It already happened and it got screwed up. We now take questions from the floor. I will call on you, and please wait for the mic. This way you can be captured on you. I love you. You are deeply a good Stalinist. No. <laughs> I am. Yeah, yes. yeah. Fuck in, democracy. You want the, order here. Yeah. <laughs> in the front here, there's two people with hands up, and we'll do them in sequence. I'm Jesse Tobelty from the philosophy department here at the University of Bergen. Now, you came here today to tell us that you are still a mm. communist. That's not an affirmation, that's a reaffirmation. So my questions are, are two. I've got, uh, the first is, what has prompted this reaffirmation of your commitment to communism? And the second question is, has your commitment to communism evolved over the years, and if so, how? I think I implicitly, maybe I failed, answer this in my, whatever you call it, bombastic word, speech talk or whatever, that it's simply... The big dilemma is for me this one. It's still, again, as I said, the Fukuyama dilemma. We are confronting a series of problems today. Among them, not only global migrations, uh, the new forms of dominations based on digital universe, ecology, and so on and so on. Is the existing liberal democratic capitalist system strong enough to cope with these problems or not? And my answer is, unfortunately, no. I'm not saying now that this means anything. Go, let's reinvent, let's return to 20th century communism. I'm totally, I totally agree with you that all these problems reappeared. Only now we are discovering all the ecological catastrophes. Go to East Germany. Whole areas are there totally contaminated. Go to parts of the Soviet Union which are even now prohibited and so on and so on. But to put it very simply, you know, I, I was 
never naively pro-communist. My diploma work in, this was early 70s, late 60s, was rejected by university. These were still communist time as not Marxist. This may surprise many of you, but you know that I began as a Heideggerian. <laughs> my, my first book was on Heideggerian language in Slovene. No, I don't, uh, today, I would settle accounts with that book in Nazi style, burn it, you know. But what I'm saying is that uh, this is, to put it in very simplistic, common sense terms, that's why I'm so distrustful about this usual liberal optimism. Like, you know, of course, all my sympathy goes with, for example, refugees. But don't turn it into a humanitarian problem, but not in this politically correct way. You know, Western people like to in, from developed countries, like to blame themselves. Like, yeah, yeah, whatever happens in third world, it's colonialism, we are guilty, and so on. No, we are not responsible, because what one should never forget, here I'm still, I'm sorry to disappoint you, staunchly pro-European Enlightenment tradition. Even political correctness itself is, I think, a misdirected application of something that is part of European tradition of enlightenment. You cannot even, I think, imagine something like political correctness outside the Western tradition. So, again, so that I don't get lost, it's not that once I was a traditional, authentic communist, but I was very lucky in Yugoslavia. You know why? Because I don't have any illusions about ex-Yugoslavia. I'm not nostalgic. But you know what was our luck? From early 60s, borders were, maybe for literally 20 dissidents, but other side were completely open. As a student, late 60s, I was going once at least every two months, if not more often, by train to London, Paris, or Munich to buy books and so on. So for us in ex-Yugoslavia, the end of communism was not this traumatic experience. Oh my God, now we know what it is. No, we were there all the time, going to the West, no illusions. And maybe this was my luck, that I had no illusions about Yugoslav, Communism, I didn't buy the stupidity of some Western communist. Yugoslavia is different. It was an authentic, democratic communism. But borders were open, so I also didn't have great illusions about the West. And it goes to my honor. Check it up. It appeared in 88, 89 in New Left Review, a short text of mine, the East European Republic of Gilead, reference to Margaret Atwood's Handmaid's Tale, where it was clear to me that I predicted there explicitly that East European post-communism will take this nationalist, fundamentalist turn, and so on, and so on. So, again, it's not that I ever was a traditional Marxist, because you know what was my formative experience? I remember when I was a young student, the big conflict in Slovenia was between Marxist, Frankfurt School, and Heideggerians. Heideggerians, more dissidents, Frankfurt School, official Marxist. Then the big French wave exploded, so-called structuralism, post-structuralism, and both sides, dissidents and the party officials, used the same language, attacking it. That's what made my identity. Okay. Through the French experience, but I'm sorry if I disappoint you too, but again, my point is this one, simply. That we are approaching problems, catastrophic potentials, and it will not be able to deal with it within the liberal democratic capitalist system. That's my, my foundation, very simple one. Yes. Directly in front of her, then in the front row over here, and we'll need to compress the answers a bit to get through. I'm sorry, I'm very sorry. Yes, I will, I will go into my Buddhist mode, you know, <laughs> this bullshit, like clap with one hand, <laughs> listen to my silence or whatever. Please, sorry. Um, so I think we can agree with that. Um, the idea of a stateless communist uh, society is kind of stupid. So could we apply the... Uh, idiot king in a the, the idiot king. Sorry, Oedipus. Idiot king, right? Yeah. Who is this? 
Okay. No, yeah, no, no, like, like, uh, uh, you talked about this in, like, uh, theocracies, where it becomes tyranny when the expert gets in charge. That's the worst, yes. Yes. Uh, that's the worst. I agree with that. So we need, like, an idiot king to be on the top, so the expert can make the decisions under him. Could that solution uh, be in a communist society? And what would it Up to a point, look yes, like? very good question. I would refer here to my Japanese friend, very intelligent, read him, his books are translated most of them into English, Kojin Karatani. And he, okay, it's p- provocative, what he, but he said now the passage from bourgeois to proletarian democracy, I quote him, is the passage from voting to lottery, you know, that there must be a dimension of lottery chance and so on to prevent expert rule and so on. So I believe that in every, whatever we call it, more authentic democracy and so on, an element of chance is needed. And that's why from ancient Greece to Venice, which was not exactly democratic, but nonetheless they were also obsessed with lottery. How did, was the, how do you call the boss? Doge, how do you? Yes, Doge. Yes. How was he selected? An incredibly complex. A nine step process, very complex. Incredibly complex, but it was a mixture of checking the person that he's not corrupted with lottery, with lot. No? So if, on the other hand, you know, it's, he is not yours, but you were once their colony. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, Denmark, no? Kierkegaard also was well aware of this, you know. I read in a biography of, how do you pronounce it correctly, Kierkegaard. Okay, we in the corrupted West say Kierkegaard. He was, I think, I read in a biography once called by the king, and like, what lessons should I learn? And he expected some deep theological, philosophical wisdom. No, you must learn how to be polite, how to say polite platitudes, and so on and so on. I believe in empty manners. All our humanity is based on empty manners. And this is what absolutely fascinates me. I've written a lot about it. How, you know, this, I call them sincere hypocrisies. For example, I don't know how you do this here, but in my country, let's say, I'm sorry, it's my old story. Some of you may know it. Let's say, no, but we are, I don't know what's our, let's say you are a millionaire. I'm a poor guy. You invite me to dinner. The bill to a restaurant, the bill arrives. In my country, it's absolutely crucial to go through this empty ritual. At the end, the bill arrives. We both know that you will pay. But I have to insist a little bit. No, let's at least share it. But not too much. Yeah, not too much, yes. Because in my ultimate evil, once I did this to a friend of mine, it was very evil. He insisted, let me pay. And I said, okay, pay. And he was, he was totally desperate. He had to claim, oh, I forgot my credit card. But, but what I'm saying, isn't this something wonderful? This is specific human communication. You make an offer, a gesture, which is expected to be rejected. But nonetheless, it has to be made. And all our communication is like this. Like, you walk on the street, you stumble upon a friend, and you tell him, oh, nice to see you, how are you doing? Usually this is a total lie. You are thinking, why didn't I see him uh, five seconds before to cross? You know, and for this we need, I'm asking, uh, answering your question, I'm not lost. For this we need idiots. There is no civilization without these idiots. Two final questions, one here, one on Twitter, 30 second answers only. Middle class opportunist, you want to combine left and right, you know. Yes, question. Yeah, my name is Gisle Sennes, Department of Comparative Literature. I had prepared a complex question concerning the unorientables of your last book. Uh, ah, oh my God, I like this. Because, it, yeah. But uh, I took the message from the moderator, so I'll just keep this short and very yeah. concrete. The signs of a communist future. You mentioned two names at least, Greta Thunberg and Julian Assange. So I would like to ask you uh, very specifically... How do you believe that the hearing about the extradition of Assange will turn out at the end of February? And how do you think the outcome would affect that sign of a possible communist future? 30-second answer. A very difficult question, because I hope Julian, he doesn't have a TV, cannot watch it, no. Because uh, I'm more 
of a pessimist. We are trying to do what can be done, organize things here and there, but the entire establishment is against him and so on and so on. But nonetheless, there are good signs here and there. Even Paul Rudd, the previous Australian prime minister, turned against extradition and so on and so on. So if you ask me about his concrete fate, I will do, but what can I do? All possible. I'm a pessimist. I think we should just hope that at least the after effect will be. Up. Twitter question, super quick, 30 second answer. Norway too suffers from the stigmatization of communists. And even though the poor are getting poorer and the rich getting richer with far right parties in parliament, workers are reluctant to turn to the left. How can we best turn the proletariat towards our cause? 30 seconds, please. <laughs> you know, uh, first, when you say poor poors are getting poorer, rich are getting richer, but still, you know, Norway is still an ideal for many of us, if I may say this, you know. <clears throat> like, this I got from my good friend Varoufakis, who said, you know, everybody protests austerity and so on. But for us or you in the developed West, austerity means, oh my God, purchase power fell for half a percent and so on. Austerity is what happens in Greece where it fell for 30 percent and so on. What I would say is, again, uh, uh, Alessandria Ocasio-Cortez formula, I'm totally again for all this new feminism and so on, gay rights and so on, but don't fall into this gap of cultural politics. Find a link with the majority because poor are getting poorer and so on and so on. Is there a political party talking for them, but not in this traditional Marxist way, it doesn't work? But, you know, because so many in the United States politically correct people, you can see that their political correctness quite often has a secret class bias. They don't say it, but the politically incorrect are the poor, primitive people, working class, and so on and so on. It's a much more complex situation, and I will say now something that you will like, but for this you will get to gulag for that. <laughs> the problem is much bigger one. Does the left... I always, I was there in uh, Occupy Wall Street and I was asking them, what do you want? Do we have a project? Many of them just had a vague idea, less corruption, big banks are corrupted. What do you want? Do, are you Fukuyamaist? A little bit more efficient system. Do you want old social democratic welfare? Do you want old style communism? And I will be very critical left, leftist. I'm the first one to admit that the left doesn't have, I don't, I'm not talking about legalistic details, but a general vision of a future society. Savoy, I don't see. Do thank you, you see? very much. Oh, okay. And thank you all for coming. You see him. You see him how evil he is. He interrupted me exactly at this pessimist point, you know. Yes. <laughs> and then he stifled and brutally with his fascist boots oppressed <laughs> the good message that I wanted to finish it. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Conversations with Tyler. You can subscribe to the podcast in iTunes, Stitcher, or your favorite podcast app. And if you like this podcast, please consider rating it on iTunes and leaving a review. This helps other people find the show.